yes, I think now you can you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. See the my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're good to go. So this presentation is all about Phragmites, what it is, why is it a problem, how to identify it, why do I get to tell you that? Um, I've been working on it, controlling it on Manitoulin Island with the Phragmites project since 2015. And at the, this point, my project and all the volunteers that I work with and local landowners, we've controlled and eradicated Phragmites from more than 90 sites here. And a site for us is anything from a, a patch of a bunch of stems to up to 50 hectares. That's our largest site. We've done a, a 50 hectares of habitat, took a few years to do. Um, so that's why I think I'm qualified to tell you about it. And uh, we've had a lot of success with what we do. So I think it's worth telling you about it. And um, one of the things that makes us successful is teaching other people to do it. So here's the Manitoulin Phragmites project, controlling and eradicating Phragmites. That's me in the hat. I'm on Manitoulin Island. Since this video is going to go up on YouTube, somebody could be watching this from just about anywhere. If you're watching from Europe or the Middle East, the things that I say tonight might not apply to Phragmites in your part of the world, but they apply to Eastern North America. So I got interested in Phragmites because people kept stopping me in the store and saying, Judith, what is that stuff on our beach? Um, I'm a biologist. I work all over the place doing environmental studies. So um, they came to me and said, what is this stuff? So I took a look at it and that, um, I looked at it and I said the same thing everybody says. I said, do we really have to worry about this? Let's study it first. So I took my GPS, my handheld GPS, and I took it and I walked around the patches of Phragmites in 2011 is yellow. 2013 is red, and you can see this thing almost doubled in size in two years. And then I went to Windsor, Ontario, which is south of where I normally live, and I saw this. And I thought to myself, no, we can't let that happen to Manitoulin Island. So I want to tell you some things about Phragmites. It's a very tall grass. It's also called common reed. I prefer to call it Phragmites as opposed to common reed because we have a lot of reeds, different kinds of reeds, and some of them are natural and really beneficial plants, and it's confusing to say the common reed, well, which one is that? So let's call it Phragmites. We call it Phragmites rather than Phragmites. So we say Phragmites is very tall. It's a Latin word. That's why it looks like it's plural. There's a lot of tall grass in this world, and not all of it is Phragmites, thank goodness. So let's get into how to identify it. It's a very tall, robust grass that has a lot of dead stalks that stay standing, but it has one central stalk like a corn stalk with leaves that come off along the central stem. And you can see me standing there and you see the leaves coming off near my arm. These are not Phragmites, these are cats and irises. These are beneficial native plants and they have all the leaves coming from the bottom like a green onion. They don't have a central stalk with leaves coming off that stem like a corn stalk. And you see those brown hot dog thingies? Those are the seed heads for the cattails. Phragmites never has that. So if you see that, that's not Phragmites. You don't have to worry about that. These are bulrushes. They're skinny. They don't have any leaves. They're just stems. These are natural native plants. These are beneficial plants. They're not Phragmites. This is Phragmites. <laughs> so it can be, uh, it can have a reddish, plume at the top, it could have a tan plume, it could have a purple or an olive colored stem at the bottom. This stand that you're seeing in this slide has a tan colored stem. You can see it in various heights and densities, depending on if it's just getting started or if it's July or if it's you know June or whatever. Um, it grows in wetlands, shores, ditches, drains, and other kinds of natural places. I even saw it growing up the side of a gravel pit in London, Ontario once where I thought it was too dry for anything to live at all. So um, it can be in a variety of places, but mostly in wet places. So this is Phragmites number one lookalike. This is the reed canary grass. And if you see this, um, this plant blooms in July and it has a narrow flowering top on it and it's mostly tan. So if you see something in bloom in July, 
It's not Phragmites, because Phragmites blooms in August or September, maybe even into October. But if it's already bloomed in September and it's all done, it's not Phragmites. That's one of the best ways to tell it. But when we're looking at it in June or in early July, when they're both the same size and they're not flowering, neither one of them, sometimes even those of us who are experts, we have to resort to it, tricky things. So the best way to tell them apart is to look inside where the where the leaf clasps the stem. Sorry, I'm looking for my webcam here. Where the leaf goes around the stem and grabs onto the stem, you look down inside here and you can see where my red arrow is. There's a little collar, a little membrane. It looks like somebody took their shirt collar and flipped it up. Phragmites does not have a shirt collar. The technical word for shirt collar is ligule. So Phragmites does not have a ligule. And then this is inevitable. We, there's, uh, there are two different subspecies of Phragmites. There's a European subspecies and an American subspecies. And they're both shown here. And I'm going to give a second lecture on how to tell these apart and what are the issues around managing one or not managing the other. Should people control American Phragmites? I prefer to call it American Phragmites rather than native Phragmites because we have a lot of situations where American Phragmites is not always in its natural habitat. And we'll get into that in the second talk I'm gonna give. But I just want to acknowledge that there are two subspecies and there are different ways to tell them apart. They're both shown here in this slide, growing together as close together as my fingers are. So how does Phragmites spread? It spreads mainly, mainly, mainly from pieces. All these pieces can sprout. And there you see, that's my hand. And you see those little roots coming off of the nodes. If the stem stems have nodes and the little roots come off and the piece, and they also get stuck to machinery. So if you drive a tracked vehicle down a ditch and the, the vehicle drives through the Phragmites and it gets these pieces stuck in it, and then you put the machine on a float and you drive it somewhere else and you drive down another ditch, then you've spread Phragmites. Same with an ATV. You drive an ATV through a bunch of Phragmites and the little pieces get stuck in the springs underneath the bike and you drive it down a trail, you probably spread it all the way down a trail. They also float. So if you take your boat through there and the prop chops it up and the pieces float, they float away. So it's mainly spread by people. A very small amount of it is spread by wildlife, um, but mostly we see Phragmites in places where people have been. So here you can see the guck in the tracks on the excavator and the stuff in deer season on the ATV there. Um, I watched every weekend on Manitoulin Island, I have a standing date by, with a friend who lives right near one of the main corners of the two highways on Manitoulin Island. And I watch pickup trucks with ATVs coming onto the island for the weekend. One, two, three, four pickup trucks going by and I wonder what's on their tires. So if you drive a vehicle through Phragmites, um, the best thing to do is to learn to recognize Phragmites and don't drive through it. But if you do, clean your machines. If you're ditching a road and you work through Phragmites, you will probably spread Phragmites all over the ditch. It's not hard to clean machinery. Um, for a job that I did, we required the contractor to clean the machinery before they entered the habitat they were working in. And it took about 20 minutes with a pressure washer and it wasn't a big deal. So if you're going out and you know you've been in Phragmites, just clean your equipment in your driveway before you go. It's an important message that we're trying to get out. And the same thing with boats. Um, if you take your boat through shallow water and you drive through the weeds and you get the weeds all tangled around the prop, I do this myself. It took me a while to figure this out. Um, and then you pull the motor up and you pull the weeds off and you throw them in the water. Oops, you've just chopped up Phragmites and thrown it back in the water. So the message that we're telling people now is if you boat through the weeds and you lift up the motor and you pull the weeds off, throw them in the boat throw them back in the boat, and then when you get to dry land, dispose of them on dry land. So how does Phragmites spread? Another thing is it has this monster root system. These roots are underground and they go, they're extensive. You could never excavate them out of there. It also has runners. So I had one of these runners that was the length of my driveway. It was 22 feet long. And you can see the nodes and the new sprouts coming up in the red circle there. Uh, there are some seeds on the plants in winter, so if you take a snow machine through it, you could be getting seeds on you. 
And it has another uh, advantage, which is that it's allelopathic, which is a word most people don't know. But what it means is a plant that can secrete toxins from its roots. So what it does is it secretes these toxins into the soil and it, it poisons the surrounding plants and then it moves into their space. And then it poisons the surrounding plants again and so moves out into their space. So eventually it's able to spread very quickly. Um, and these monster roots and the, the effects that it has, it can alter the flow of water in the soil in fact, the moisture levels by all the dense thatch and all the dead stalks that it creates. And the result is you get a complete change in the ecosystem and you get a huge stand of nothing but Phragmites and you've lost your natural habitat. You've lost your turtle habitat and your fish spawning. Excuse me. So how does it spread? Here's an example. Um, this is a 2014 picture of the Queen Mum Park. And um, you can see that the ATVs have been ripping around in there. And there's us in 2017, three years later, controlling Phragmites. Uh, this is 2011. I was went out to look. And I, when I first saw this picture, first took this picture, I thought this was super alarming. That guy's 6'2", and look at the Phragmites. And now I think, oh, yeah, we could clean that up in a couple of hours. But that was 2011. Then it turned into this in 2016. That's me in the hat. And then it turned into this in 2017 with us trying to control it. So you definitely don't want this in front of your cottage. So you can see that if you have this, um, it's going to affect your wildlife habitat, your turtle nesting on the beach, your monarchs, because there'll be no milkweed there. Uh, great blue herons, uh, if the Phragmites, if the shallow water is all covered up with that, you've got lost your fish, fish spawning habitat, um, you could be losing turtles that are at risk, things that are in, um, endangered that grow on beaches, the recreational use of beaches is affected because who wants to walk through that stuff, and the enjoyment of your cottage, tourism, if you have this on the beach, no one's going to go there, and it's also an infrastructure problem because if you have that in a sewage lagoon, you, you could have a very costly problem. It also affects sight lines and ditch flow because, excuse me, uh, because if the ditches are full of this and the water doesn't flow, then you can have flooded farm fields, um, flooded roads, um, difficult situations on highways where you can't see. And it's also an aesthetic problem. So what's at stake? Natural habitats, your property value, and some economic issues. All right, all right, what are we gonna do about it? There's my awesome uh, field team there, cutting by hand so that they can preserve the natural bulrushes. There is, fortunately, a best management practices document. There actually are two now, which tell you what you can do about it so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to try everything because we've already figured that out. And believe me, I've tried all of the ones that you think you're going to try, and I'm going to tell you which ones do work. So this is the newest uh, best management practices document. You can download this from the Ontario Phragmites Working Group. If you don't have the link right there, it is on our Facebook page. Um, this is new, and it tells you a lot about species at risk habitat, and it tells you a lot about um, uh, how to tell American Phragmites from European Phragmites. This is an older document, also the links on our Facebook page. Um, it tells you a little bit more about the techniques for how to do these things. And I think it's still a very valuable document. It's a little easier to understand than the new one, a little bit shorter download. The best way to get rid of Phragmites is if it's in standing water is to cut it all and drown the roots. So you have to cut all of the stems all the way down as far down as you can reach, which hopefully is at the bottom. But if you're in deeper water, you cut it down as far as you can reach. And what you want to do is cut it down far enough that if it decides to sprout, it's not going to make it back up to the surface again. And the roots won't get any oxygen and they will drown. And we have excellent results with this. We can get a 75% reduction in the first year in the, in the, uh, the density of the Phragmites, which is awesome. Um, it's a very effective technique. Uh, you need about two feet of water, 40 centimeters of water. If you don't have that, do it anyway. It'll just take you a little bit longer. The one thing is you have to haul all of the Phragmites that you cut out of the water, because if you don't, all those pieces are going to float away and sprout, and you won't be any further ahead. Here's some of the tools that we use for cutting. Uh, that hook thingy is a raspberry cane cutter. I've 
got them from Lee Valley. You can also get them from the Invasive Phragmites Control Center. They are an awesome thing. They have a telescoping handle and they make it so that you don't have to bend over. The inside of the hook is sharp and it makes it so you can cut the Phragmites right down at the bottom, which is awesome. Um, we've also done lots and lots of cutting with these hand clippers. Um, my little tip there is to attach something to it in case you drop it in the water so you can find it. It's nice to have a plastic sled because then you can just pile the frag on a sled, but you don't have to. Phragmites floats. You can just float it next to you and bundle it all up and carry it out. We also use gas powered brush cutters. You can cut a lot more in a day, but you're still limited by how much you can carry out with your arms and your back in a day. So you can see my crew there, the guy in the orange with the brush cutter and the other ones uh, with rakes and things to contain all the little bits because brush cutters make a few more bits and pieces than just cutting by hand. And you can see that big pile that's gonna have to be carried out of the water. We use the still combi system. Uh, Husqvarna also makes a thing like this. It's got a reciprocating hedge trimmer cut type of thing on the, on, the, on the bottom that goes like this when it cuts. Um, it's not made for cutting in water. You have to make sure that you keep it greased, grease the bearings every day after work, um, spray it down with fluid film or something that prevents rust. Um, this thing works awesomely. The ones that are rotary, where their uh, rotary head don't work quite as well in water. But no matter what tool you use, this is your limiting factor is how much you can carry out in a day. There she goes, trying to carry a big bundle out in a day. We also use spading, which is using a shovel. We're not actually digging it out. We're just slicing into the rhizome. And what we do is you slice in next to the stem. Here's the stem. You slice in at an angle and you pull a stem out. And what you've done is you've prevented this piece of rhizome from talking to this piece of rhizome. And there's a little gap there and these pieces die. And over the course of a few years, you can reduce the density of the patch and, and eventually the, the area of the patch. It's a control technique, but it's very effective. Um, you don't actually have to dig. Here's a spading card that shows you how to do it. You slice in at an angle to the stem. And down in step five and six, you pull the stem out, but you leave the soil undisturbed. And then you've damaged part of the rhizome and there you go. You do need to be careful about uh, transporting it. And what do you do with it? Just put it somewhere dry, anywhere dry, leave it to dry out in your driveway or in a parking lot or something. On Manitoulin Island, we have flat rock, so we leave it out on flat rock. And it dries out very quickly. Once it's completely dry, you can burn it or you could take it to the landfill or you could just leave it if it's not in your way. Um, but it's not going to spread once it's dry, it, it will be dead. We also do use herbicide. I don't like herbicide, but I became a licensed exterminator so that I could use it. So I could be the one to make that decision of is it really necessary? I believe it's a weapon of last resort. A small amount of herbicide versus the loss of a natural habitat. Sometimes it comes down to that. Uh, we have used it in many situations and there are a lot of places where you couldn't tell that we've sprayed. If it's done cautiously and responsibly hitting mostly only the Phragmites, it is effective. It's one of the only things that will kill the roots of the Phragmites when Phragmites is on land and not in water. It's very hard to get rid of large patches of Phragmites when they're not in water. If you are gonna use herbicide, um, it requires different kinds of approvals. In Ontario, it requires Ministry of Environment and Conservation and Parks approvals. Or if you're on a First Nation, that would be chief and council and the uh, approval of your community. It has to be applied by someone with the license. And there may be some other permits depending on where you live. Obviously, you want this to be applied by somebody who's cautious. And also we work with the trucks or cutting program. It comes from the Invasive Phragmites Control Center. It uh, says approximately $8,000 a day. You think, oh my gosh, that's expensive. But when you see how much these machines can clear in a day, it's very cost effective. It, it, these machines can do things that human beings could never finish. They couldn't possibly clear 50 hectares of Phragmites habitat. So, um, what this is, is it's a floating machine. It has a track with little paddles. It paddles itself through the water. Well, actually, Chad drives it through the water. <laughs> and um, it has a big reciprocating cutter blade on the front that goes underwater, and it cuts the Phragmites underwater. The Phragmites floats up. And then if there's a second uh, Truxer, uh, that one will have a rake attachment on the front, or else it'll switch out the floating cutter and put the rake on and go and rake it all up. The limitation is still how much you can get out of the water in a day. 
There you can see the two truxers working at Michael's Bay, getting ready. This is this, there's no Phragmites at this site now. It works. Uh, if you do wanna work with these machines, there is, a, there is a fair amount of logistics to working with them in addition to the cost. Um, you have to have good access to get the machines into the water. They have to have a place where you can turn around their big 30 foot trailers. And you have to figure out how you're going to dispose of dump truck loads of biomass. That's me in the hat. But they're awesome. People always ask me, well, can we take the seed heads off? Um, this is my personal experience with it. I feel that it's not a good idea because it's better for the seeds to fall someplace where you already know there's Phragmites and you're already working on it. If you take the seeds off and you put them in a bag and you put them in your car and you get them on your clothes and you go home, and then what are you gonna do with the bag? You don't know where all those seats are gonna go. It's very hard to control that. I feel that it's better not to do this. However, if you are gonna do it, do it with two people, have one person hold the bag, bend the seed heads into the bag and then cut and then seal the bag. I don't recommend it. However, some people feel that it's better because it limits their flowering. But I think that most of the spread that you deal with generally is from uh, root, roots spreading, spreading the patch outward. Better to leave the seeds where they are. They asked me about tarping, believe me, we've tried it. Not a good idea. It's very expensive to buy enough tarp. And we held the tarp down with big rocks and pieces of firewood. And Phragmites was strong enough to just push its way out around the sides of the tarp. It was not, a, was not effective. Uh, it, is, it is effective to teach people about Phragmites. And one of the things we're trying to tell people is learn to recognize it and then don't drive through it. Clean your machines, clean your ATVs, don't boat through it and pull the weeds off and throw them in your boat. So these are our messages that we're trying to get out. We also have Manitoulin Phragmites Week here. We have an event week every summer, third week of July, where we make a big effort to get people out, have them come help us, demonstrate how to do control work. We make house calls and we offer assistance on people's properties. Have us come out where we're the frag doctors. Uh, we give info section sessions and uh, other events. And we generally just get some team spirit going because it's not too bad to work on frag if you've got enough people and you're all having a good time together. So what we do is the third week of July is the time for everybody to go out and do this together. We do need to get Phragmites off of roadsides. It doesn't look like it's a bad thing to have Phrag in a ditch. Okay, it's only in a ditch, but if we have it in ditches, it's gonna spread from there into more sensitive places. I do wanna show you some success stories. It's not a terrible, horrible, uh, gloomy story. We, we've had very good success with this. Corner up there, you can see Wikwem Kong, uh, Thomas Bay, that's 2017, us getting ready to go brush cut that. In 2019, it was gone and hadn't come back and it's still not back. Same thing, this is Fisher Bay on Manitoulin Island. That was the picture of the uh, kids hand cutting there. And it's, it's gone from that site. Oops, sorry about that. This is Providence Bay, which is Manitoulin's big public beach in 2015 when Lake Huron was low. Water level was low and there was kind of a wet area behind the shore there and it was filled with Phragmites. And this is looking in the opposite direction, but you can see in 2020, there's no Phragmites there now. There's nothing there. And some people said to me, well, it's because the water came up, you know, you didn't do anything, the water came up. But the fact is that if we hadn't taken the Phragmites out, this beach would not look like that. This is also in Wikwem Kong, Kaboni Beach looking north. 2016, here it is looking 2020, same view. It's just gorgeous there. This is Michael's Bay. This is one of our larger sites. We started out with 19 hectares filled with Phragmites. This is 2016. And here is, you're looking the opposite direction, but the beach has nothing, no Phragmites there. I just wanna cry every time I go there because it's so beautiful. And this is at the far end of this slide is the mouth of the Blue Jay. This is where you're standing now. The mouth of the Blue Jay Creek in 2016 was a big wall of Phragmites. We had the trucks are coming program there for three years. And now you're looking, you're on the opposite side of the Blue Jay looking back towards the previous slides. And there's no Phragmites there. We have about four hectares of little scattered stems that we're still working on, but it's beautiful. 
That's the shut up and stop talking slide. So please get started. Think of your project as a multi-year process. It's not a one-shot deal. You don't just go in and get rid of it. It takes a uh, do it, reduce it, do a little more, reduce it, and watch out, keep, keep at it, but you can reduce it. We've eradicated it from quite a number of sites now. So don't get discouraged, get started. And uh, thank you to all our really wonderful sponsors and all of our donors and volunteers. There's our Facebook page at the bottom and also our email, manitoulinfrag at yahoo.com. And that's mainly what I have to say. And leave, I think you can stop recording.